Yeah, it's showing me a little bit corrupt still. Let's see. I'm hoping that the visual is a little bit better. So hi everyone, and welcome you to Accessibility Talks. Uh, this is our monthly virtual meetup where we go to chat about digital accessibility, inclusivity, usability. And each month we invite a speaker to present a topic. And then afterwards we invite the community to ask questions and participate in the discussion. Um, I wanna just take a moment to remind folks that our group seeks to provide a friendly, safe environment. And so we require all participants to adhere to the accessibility code of conduct. This applies to all community interaction and events. So verbal questions, chat, uh, social media, everywhere. Uh, this code of conduct can be found on our website, uh, allytalks.com, that's A-1-1-Y-T-A-L-K-S. And all participants should be able to engage in productive dialogue um, and sharing and learning with each other with mutual respect. All right, so moving on, if you have any questions for our speaker, please post it in the Twitter uh, with the hashtag AllieTalk, same, same as our website, either in the chat window if you're participating in the live chat or again on social media. I am today's host, my name is Carrie Fisher and I work as a senior front, no, not even, senior accessibility consultant and trainer at DQ. And with me is Tim Harshbarger who also works at DQ, and he's gonna introduce himself in a little bit. Um, but it is, is it true, Tim, that you do know Portuguese? Um, I used to know it. I'm not as good now because I don't get to speak it every day, so. Well, if anyone knows Portuguese, pop a question in Portuguese <laughs> in the chat, and let's see if we can stump Tim. <laughs> Both of your screen reader questions and with the Portuguese. Uh, without any further ado, Tim, I'm going to go ahead and get to the presentation. Go ahead and share that for you. Oops. All right, so now we're getting ready. I'm going to make it a uh, full present presentation mode. Uh, and we're on that first slide, Tim. Okay. So first of all, I guess I'll introduce myself. My name is Tim Harshbarger. Um, as as uh, Carrie said, uh, I, I am a senior accessibility consultant with DQ. I also help out with training. Um, uh, disclose a little bit myself. I've been doing accessibility for a long, long time for probably since uh, actually the very end of 94. Uh, started doing accessibility with, and accommodations, um, and then eventually just started doing accessibility all the time. Previously worked at State Farm and doing that, and uh, uh, in, and uh, did that for many years, and then decided to come over and join the queue and uh, get the opportunity to work with people like Carrie and do some training and, and help out with a bunch of other stuff. Um, I am also a screen reader user. I'm actually totally blind. I have no sight whatsoever. Um, and, you know, as we go through this, honestly, any questions you have about screen reader use, about uh, uh, visual impairments, any questions whatsoever, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, I, I'm more than glad to answer whatever questions you might have. So I basically wanna let you know that today we're doing an intro to screen reader, screen readers. And so if you're not familiar with a screen reader, the screen reader is a piece of software. And of course it gets its name because uh, it reads the screen. And so what a screen reader does is it looks at, it gathers information from whatever user interface that somebody who's blind is using and speaks aloud whatever is pertinent uh, to, that, to that person so that I can, so when I can't see, when see the interface, I can hear what's going on. Um, now, one reason why we're always interested in this accessibility, because if an application is designed to be accessible, then the information past the screen reader and then passed to the user is even better. And, you know, you have a better user experience. The person can be effective in the things they're trying to do. When applications aren't designed that way, the screen reader may not be able to convey any information to the user, in which case it's, they're basically not going to be able to use that app or website or whatever we're talking about.
So well, one thing we want to talk about is real versus uh, uh, accessibility testing. So there's a bunch of different types of people use screen readers, but everybody uses for a different purpose. So the one thing you need to know is we're partially talking about two usages, that is people with disabilities, such as people who are blind, using a screen reader to be able to use us uh, to be able to use apps uh, each and every day and access websites and things like that. Uh, the other thing is using accessible using a screen reader as a testing a uh, testing tool. So that is if you're interested in making your website accessible or your application accessible, you might use a screen reader to test it. Those are really two different things. Partly the reason they're two different things is usually when you're doing accessibility testing, you're trying to ensure that the information that's being provided by the page, the functionality that's accessible through the page is also accessible to someone using a screen reader. You're in many ways trying to ensure that everything that you designed into your accessibility um, is working correctly so that the techniques you're using are techniques that work well, uh, that the things you considered in design, such as though the meaningful alt text is being conveyed across to this person who's using a screen reader. That's a little bit different than getting, a, you're not really as a, someone who's testing with a screen reader trying to uh, simulate the user experience because that's kind of hard for you to do unless you're somebody who uses a screen reader all the time. Um, in fact, typically, my suggestion is if you want the user experience piece, then that's time to find people with disabilities and have them test the application and then do a usability test where you can observe them using the interface and get to see what kind of issues they have and maybe afterwards interview them and talk to them about what's what was going on during the testing. So that's the one thing to keep in mind. Frequently when you're doing it for accessibility, really you're testing techniques, you're testing to make sure stuff is, is being conveyed correctly to the screen reader and to the user. And of course, usually if you wanna get the user experience piece, that's when you wanna use real people with real disabilities to, uh, to perform tasks and, and observe and see what you can learn from that. So basically we'll talk a little bit about the types of different types. So, different types of screen readers and what kind of combinations, because this is a common question that I frequently get, and I'm sure that many of you who do accessibility get the same question about screen reader browser combinations to test. So, so, so let's talk about, there's basically you have, you have the Windows environment, right? You have the Mac OS environment, and those are kind of desktop. You also have Linux as well. Um, then you get into environments like uh, Android and iOS. So on the Windows side, there's two major screen readers. There's also one that's built into Windows Narrator. And honestly, they've made a lot of strides to improve that, that screen reader, but it's still probably not one that's as commonly used by people who are blind as the other two we're gonna talk about. So one is called NVDA, which is non-visual desktop assistant, and it's an open source uh, screen reader, and we're actually going to be demoing that today. And so it's open source, so it's free. Uh, it can be downloaded. You can go to the NV Access site and download it to your Windows machine and install it and then start running it. JAWS, which is an acronym that stands for Job Access with Speech, is a commercial screen reader. So it does cost money to purchase and uh, maintain. Uh, but it's the other major screen reader that's available on Windows. Um, on Mac OS, so on the other platforms, you really don't have as many choices. So on Linux, the primary screen reader you want to use, particularly in a GUI environment, is called Orca. And then, um, and really, I'm going to be talking a lot about that since I don't have enough experience with Linux and Orca to be able to really provide you any uh, in, information other than just stuff I've maybe read in the past. And, um, then for Mac OS, uh, the screen reader is VoiceOver. Um, and VoiceOver is basically the only screen reader you can really use on Mac. It's also the same for iOS. It's VoiceOver is on iOS. Uh, when you're talking about the Android environment, you're talking about TalkBack as the screen reader. Now, if you're testing websites, um, one approach is you could test multiple screen readers with multiple browsers. 
Um, and the, the thing with that, there can be some value to that. However, what you'll often find is the more screen readers and browsers you test, the fewer differences you see. And often what you start to get into um, is user agent issues. So we often recommend, or I often recommend that you start with just testing with a single browser and screen reader combination. Again, you can branch out and do some of the other testing for some aspects of it, but it's, it's usually a good place to start with one. So for instance, if you're on Windows, a good place to start is with NVDA and Chrome or JAWS and Chrome. You could also use Firefox instead. Uh, part of the reason why we suggest I suggest those combination is because um, a screen reader works in a complex environment, and basically that environment is your app or your website, the browser, the OS, and the screen reader. So what happens is your screen, your uh, app, for instance, you're using alt text, you provide alt text in the, in there. the browser parses your site. It provides that, puts that information to DOM. That information gets passed by the accessibility OP, uh, API and the OS. It gets passed to the screen reader, which then can read it to this, read it to the user. So for that to work, all those pieces have to work together. And there's some combinations that seem to work together and have fewer issues than others. So, and again, on Windows, that's usually NVDA and Chrome or NVDA Firefox and JAWS, Chrome, JAWS, Firefox are fairly good combinations. On the Mac, it's usually uh, VoiceOver and Safari. On iOS, iOS, it's the same thing, VoiceOver and Safari. Uh, and of course, on Android, it tends to be TalkBack and Chrome. Um, if you test with other combinations, you'll probably be okay most of the time but you're a little more likely to run into some of those user agent issues or some other uh, odd issues that can crop up when you're doing the testing uh, with, a, with a screen reader and browser combination. Of course, if you're just testing native apps, you know, there's fewer pieces that have to work together. It's just your app, it's the OS, and it's the uh, screen reader. Okay, so um, basically, actually, at this point, if I'm going to go through the settings, should I just go ahead and share my screen here? Yeah, do yeah. you want to go through the slides real quick and then you can do that as part of the demo? Sure, which slide would we be on? Let's jump to the commands. Okay, so there are, so when you're using a screen reader, there'll be keyboard commands. Uh, so one thing you'll find when you're using a screen reader, they'll often have a screen reader key. So an NVDA documentation will be called the NVDA key and JAWS will be called the JAWS key. With voiceover will be called the voiceover key or the VO key. Um, I don't know what TalkBack uses if it, if it has keyboard access, but something tells me it has that. And the idea is that most of these environments such as Windows provides a uh, a rich environment of keyboard shortcuts already. So for instance, and in Windows, uh, Windows M will minimize all your apps and take you to the desktop. So there's a bunch of keystrokes like that. Well, in order not to conflict with those, um, often the screen reader will use its own modification key and they'll call it, you know, for instance, NVDA key. And then that in combination with other keystrokes will do special screen reader functions. There are also going to be some that don't work exactly like that. But that's one thing when we're talking about that. So for instance, with NVDA, you can bring up your preference menu by hitting the NVDA N key, or you can quit NVDA by hitting the NVDA Q key. So and that NVDA key is something that actually can be customized. So for instance, on my system, I use the caps lock. I believe by default, it may be uh, control shift is maybe what they use. Um, but, and then of course you can change that again for each of the different screen readers. You know, they may use the insert key. Um, actually that's what MVD uses by default is the insert key. Um, uh, JAWS also uses that by default, but you can change it to other stuff. Uh, voiceover uses command option. Is that right? Uh, control option. Control yeah, option. That's... Control. 
That's yeah. a default, but you can also set it to the caps lock. Um, yeah. Otherwise, Tim, I know we've talked also about in training, you can do that. Uh, you can remap your keys too, if you wanted to use a yep. different key. You can do that as well. Um, some of the keystrokes we're going to get into, because we'll be looking at uh, so, uh, some web pages, is we're also going to be getting into some hotkeys that are used by NVDA. Um, these are going to be ones that allow you to skip around the page to move to different things, such as H for headings, uh, D for landmarks, F for form fields, T for tables. So these are going to be some of the keyboards. Uh, often, if you're in uh, a, a the document mode when you're using a screen reader on Windows, you also be able to use the up and down arrow keys to move through the page and read the read all the contents. But we'll get more into that when we get into the demo. Um, is there anything you want to add on that, Carrie? That I missed. Yeah, I mean the only other thing, Tim, and and just by the way, Tim and I do do a lot of training together. So yep. usually we're like tag teaming, but uh, I wanted him to be able to to give this content himself as well, especially the demo. Um, but the idea is in the last few slides, we had uh, three different tables showing kind of the differences between NVDA and voiceover. And from, I think even just a beginner point of view, we can see how much uh, easier it possibly could be using NVDA. There's a lot less uh, commands to remember, fingers to, <laughs> to use at all one time. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Is there a preference for you, for instance, using NVDA versus uh, I'm a more used to, I'm more used to using Windows, but that's because I, I tend to use that development environment a lot more than I have used Mac. I've used both. You, you do get used to it. And also the one other thing you may notice, and you'll notice that most screen readers share most features in common. So for instance, all, all pretty much all screen readers when you're web browsing a web page provide some way to skip by headings and landmarks and form fields and things like that. So the keystrokes are usually different, but the things you're wanting to do are fairly much the same across the board. So that's one thing you'll notice with screen readers. Again, largely their feature sets are very common. Well, because you can, if you're mad, yeah, you know, I mean, you can imagine that most blind people are people with low vision are using a screen reader, are, are performing the same kind of functions and doing things kind of similar kind of ways. There's usually a few things that are different between them, but it's usually a lot more in common that are different. All right, Tim, and that kind of takes us to the demo section. I think I, I wrote the words, uh, words are great, but demos are much more fun. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing the presentation and let you take over the share. Okay. Let's, let's see here. There's the share screen. Your computer sound. And we'll share the screen here. Need a control Can you, you remind us too, Tim, which screen reader that you're using? I am currently using NVDA is what I am using. Is the screen up? It is up. I can see a wiki uh, page and a okay. uh, blue outline. Okay. So typically, typically with NVDA, if you're going to start it up. Let's see here. Notepad plus plus checkbox. Note.js document. NVDA scratch for that shortcut. Check oh, check. No, but NVDA checkbox check six. You'll want to go, you can go to the, you'll, you'll just click on your NVDA icon and it will start it up. In fact, I could do. And then I will start it back up. There, it makes a little, makes that little noise that lets you know that it started up. Um, you'll want to change some settings in NVDA when you're using it for your testing. Um, you can either do that by bringing up the preferences using the NVDA down in, this, in the little system tray down at the bottom right hand side, or you can use the NVDA key N, which would by default be insert N. In my case, it's caps lock N. NVDA menu. It brings that up. Preferences sub -menu and you go key. to preferences. Settings dot dot dot. S. And you go into settings. NVDA settings colon. General left parent. Normal configuration. We'll take a little tour of some of these things here. Speech two of 14. General one of so here is speech, right? This is something you probably want. You want? Oops. NVDA menu preferences sub menu settings dot dot dot. So much for that. NVDA settings colon. 
Speech tool for okay. speech property page. Synthesizer grouping. Synthesizer editor. So you basically want to go through here and you can like change your synthesizer. synthesizer. Code factory revoke is the Expand synthesizer windows one core voices. And if you're using so I have uh I actually have Microsoft is the code factory vocal code factory eloquence. I have eloquence and vocalizer on here. Those are not those are I had the purchased separately. Um, and I did that because I prefer eloquence and it's more robotic sounding voice. Um, if by default, if you install NVDA, you'll have eSpeak, which is an open source screen reader, which is very robotic sounding. Microsoft Speech API version 5. And of course, uh, speech, the Microsoft Speech API 5. Windows 1 Core Voices. But then you'll have Windows Core Voices. So you, if by default, that likely will be what's selected for you. So you could go in and change that. Is there a reason why you'd want to hear a different kind of voice besides just preference? Well, in my case, I prefer more robotic voices because at faster speeds, they're easy to understand. So the one thing is there's some very human sounding voices. And if you like them and prefer them, definitely don't hesitate to use them if you're doing your testing or even if you're using a screen reader, because you really want to use a voice you're comfortable with. I prefer the robotic sounding voice because what happens in order for the human voice to remain human sounding, as it speeds up, they have to begin to elide words and sounds um, to maintain that human sound to it. Because that's what happens when real human beings speak faster. With the robotic speech, it doesn't do any of that stuff. It just says the word faster. So um, it's a little easier at faster speeds to understand what the screen reader is saying if it's more robotic than if it's natural sounding, at least for me. Again, getting used to that speech can take some time. So originally I started off very slow with robotic speech and it took time to speed up. Audio output device colon, synthesizer colon, combo box windows one core voices collapse audio. Yeah. audio and that's colon. one thing that you said, and I don't know if you've mentioned it to this group before, but you weren't necessarily born blind, that you became blind. And so throughout that um, process and learning yeah. screen readers, you had to you know, you had to learn, right? Like the rest of us, yeah. the new technology. Yeah, I progressively lost my sight over time. And I eventually had to switch to a screen reader because I was using magnification, but it get, got tough enough to read, particularly anything of any length that way that I started switching over to a screen reader. And over time, because the sight got worse, I used the screen, used the screen reader more and uh, magnification less. And then, I, and then when I was involved in an accident where I lost the remainder of my sight and just switched over using a screen reader. So it was over time. The first time I actually, I had a friend at work who let me use his screen reader when I was getting ready. And he basically said, hey, if you want to come down after work, you know, you can, you can try learning how to use a screen reader on my system. And I'd go down. And the first thing I learned was how to change the speech rate because he had it really fast and I needed it really, really slow to be able to, understand anything it said. And it took time uh, to, to, you know, first I had to listen to it really slow and that, and I, you know, it's like, I couldn't imagine listening to it faster, but you know, after spending about a week doing it that way, I was like, okay, I could, I, it's, I think I could bump up the speed a little bit. And then over time I kept bumping up the speed till I reached where I'm at now. Um, so that's, that's one of those things about screen reader. So again, you know, if you're just doing testing with screenings, don't worry about the speed. Whatever speed you hit, listen to it is is good enough. Um, you just realize that when you're listening to a real screen reader user, they'll probably listen to it faster. And that the only reason they can do that is because they spend a lot of time listening to it. There's no magic in being able to understand it. It just takes time to get used to the, the voice. Change dot dot dot. So. Voice colon. Combo box Microsoft Zira collapsed. So what you're hearing now is this is uh, this is Zira, which is one of the Microsoft voices. Microsoft David. So there's David. Micro Microsoft Mark. And there's Mark. Mike. Microsoft David. I'm gonna actually choose David for now, but so you have those choices and you can pick some of those voices. Um, actually, if you go to the Windows site, you can or Microsoft site, you can actually download additional voices in a different additional languages. Great colon. Slider 50. Here's the, here's the important part, the rate. So 51. So right 50, now it's a 50. 40, so we're going to slow down. 47, 46, 45, 44, 43, 42, 41, 40. So we'll go down to 40. Rate boost checkbox. Not and here's some other features. You usually don't need to change any of these. Pitch colon, volume colon, 
automatic language, automatic punctuation slash symbol. No, with the I say it says automatic language switching. If your software synthesizer, the part that does the speech, supports multiple languages, um, what will happen is the screen reader will switch automatically depending on what kind of language tags are being used in the documents or um, in the system. Trust voice of include capital sake beep use sp okay cancel but apply button alt Let's plus apply. A, speech property page change dot 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 synth categories colon braille three of vision four of fourteen. So another one you'll want to change is under vision. Vision property page configure visual aids period. Focus highlight. And you'll want to turn on focus highlight. Not checked. What? Checked. Well, I guess it was already turned on. I forgot. Category. It. So you'll want to do that. And basically that's going to, whenever you, the screen reader is reading something, it's going to put a focus rectangle around the part of the screen that the screen reader is focused on. If you're using, you know, for me, this is adds no functionality because I can hear what's going on and I'm comfortable with that. But if you're doing testing and you can see, this can often help you figure out exactly what in the world is the screen reader reading and which part of the page that is. Keyboard five, mouse, keyboard five. Here's the keyboard, keyboard section here. Page. And keyboard this is where you can actually change what's keyboard uh, is the NVDA modifier key or the NVDA key. So in my case, I use, uh, I use the caps lock. I also changed it, you can probably see here that I'm using a laptop as opposed to the desktop layout for NVDA. Uh, that's because I use both a, a Bluetooth desktop keyboard and a and laptop keyboard. Of course, it's part of the laptop where I have NVDA on right now. Categories. Um, mouse six of so mouse mouse property page report. So enable mouse tracking checkbox. Here's the mouse. There's a enable mouse tracking. Uh, if you're doing testing, I suggest you turn that off for your testing. The reason why is because it's very easy to bump your mouse or your trackpad accidentally. And when you do that, the screen reader will start speaking a bunch of information pertaining to what the, where the mouse is at. And sometimes that can get confusing and you may not realize you bumped the mouse. You're thinking, why is it not reading what I expect it to? And you're gonna spend time trying to trace down an issue that just was you bumped the mouse. And, um, and it's speaking stuff. And also I expect um, if you have a tendency to reach over for your mouse, it's gonna make it less likely that you start trying to test using your mouse and the screen reader and you'll stick to using the keyboard, which is the way you should test when you're using a screen reader. Report mouse shape chain categories, review cursors, input comp, object presentation. Okay, that's all for that. There's a bunch of other settings here. Apply, cancel, but okay button. And if you want to learn about them, there's actually documentation for NVDA that goes through all the different settings. Main window window. The other things that really can be important menu. with NVDA is. Preferences sub, tool sub menu. So you go back to the NVDA and you go to uh, menu and you go down to tools. View lock, speech viewer s and you turn on speech viewer Show speech viewer on startup check so now with that on now a little caption window comes up and it will actually speak whatever you'll see visually whatever the screen reader is speaking meeting controls row zoom row one column wikipedia comma, so if i go here wikipedia, main landmark so you could hear that you could hear that but you could also see it in the captioning window uh, another nice thing is whatever text is in the caption window, you can actually go copy and paste it if you need to keep a copy of it. So that's another thing you can do with the, the with that. But so, you know, the, again, the two really key things to do is you want to turn on the highlight so you can see where the screen reader is reading a page. And then you can also uh, use the captioning to see exactly what it's saying if you're having trouble understanding the speech. Um, and sometimes that reading that along with listening to it can reinforce what it's saying or allow you to, to figure out if it's missaying something. Um, so right now we're in a browser, if we're in Chrome, I'm on the Wikipedia page. And so I'm gonna show you some basic keystrokes for using um, using NVDA. So once, once NVDA is in the Chrome window, um, it goes into what's called document mode. It's sometimes called browse mode or virtual cursor mode. Um, and basically this is a mode that lets the user explore the whole page. And the reason why we have this feature is because without it, if you think about it, uh, how would you access the page content in the page without a mouse? You would tap. Main landmark, jump to navigation link. 
So I have a jump to navigation link here. Jump to search link. And basically I'm hitting the tab key, which Wikipedia. is normally when if you're using a keyboard and you want to get it right on the page. Free link freak. But you can quickly start to see Encyclopedia link encyclopedia. Why this might be a problem. Anyone can add because it means there's a whole bunch of content that doesn't receive keyboard focus. Six comma two forty one comma six seventy six links that I can't read. English. So so this is often we call this forms mode. This is the mode that if you're just doing keyboard testing, you'd be in without a screen reader where you just tab through the interface and use your air keys to switch between radio buttons and, and use spacebar to check check boxes and enter to activate buttons. But if you hit the NVDA and spacebar, it switches you out of that mode into document mode. And with document mode, now I can use the up and down arrow key and start reading to the page. List with nine items link the arts. Link biography. So see, I'm going through this. Link geography. Link history. And I can go down the page. Link mathematics. But the other thing it allows me to do is it allows me to use my keyboard is a faster way to navigate the page because what happens in browse mode, document mode, is a screen reader will intercept all the keys that you type on the keyboard and decide if those are keyboard commands it needs to do something about. Otherwise, I'll pass it through. So for instance, I'm here and I want to move to the he next heading from where I'm at. I hit the H key. From today, apostrophe S featured article heading level two, English language. So see there, it told me the heading level two and it gave me the details about that. If I hit H again, did you know dot 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 takes me to did you heading know two. Um, if I hit the shift H from today, apostrophe S it takes featured me article back to the previous level one. Two. So, so I can skip around headings that way. And often that's a feature that most screen reader users will use because it provides a quick way to get around the page. If I want to move around by something called landmarks, Personal tools navigation. I hit the D key. With five so, for instance, let me go back to the top of the page. Out of list. Personal tools. Main landmark. So, I'm here at the main landmark. Now, what that tells me, main tells me that this is the main part of the page. If it had said banner, I'd know if it was at the heading of the page. If it said content info, I'd know I was at the very bottom of the page of that, that legal information. You know, so, so this page not only has a main, but also has a bunch of navigation landmarks uh, to allow you to navigate around the site or parts of the site. Um, so that's another key that someone with a screen reader use. The last one that yeah, probably gets used frequently is the F key, which is form control. Search landmark, search edit, search Wikipedia, search Wikipedia, left bracket, alt dash, shift dash, F right bracket. So hitting that F key kind of moved me to the, to the next form control. Hitting shift F moves me backwards. So that's one thing they know. With all these keys, once you know the key to go forward, the key to go backwards is just the same keystroke with a shift. Um, so you can do that. Now I'm here in this edit field. One thing I can do is I can hit enter. Search landmark. And now uh, you heard that popping sound. That means I'm now into forms mode where I can type in like regular on the keyboard. You also see the border of the highlight, the screen reader highlight changed. Um, it's different colors depending on whether you're in browse mo mode or in um, forms mode. 2 colon 33 p.m. Um, let's see what else should I show you on this page real quickly. Actually, I'll show you tables. HTML. Heading level 119. So this is a table I put together um, from the National Weather Center using data from the Historical National Weather Service database. Um, basically, I could also use a T key to move to the next table on this page. So I do that. Table with six rows and five columns, row one season, column one season. So you heard that. It told me how many columns and rows this table has, which helps me navigate around. Now, I hold that, if I hold down this, the control, alt, and then the arrow keys, I can move around this kind of like you would in Excel spreadsheet if you use your arrow keys. So I can go to the right, uh, control, control, alt, to the right to move across the columns. Precipitation left paren, min temp left paren, average temp left paren, degrees okay, so, F right paren. So let's say I'm over here with average temperature. I'm in that column. Now, if I want to go down and find out what the average temperature is for winter, 
I would start to go down this column and I'd use con I'd use control alt down arrow annual row 227.4 so there it told me uh, annual is 27.4 winter row 37.0 in the winter at 7.0 really really cold on on Mount Washington summer row 447.4 47.4 is that so you notice here as I'm going down it's reading the row headers the new row headers for this column each time I go down now I'm in summer um, if I hit the right arrow key it's going to read the column header max temp left paren degrees f right paren column 552.6 so it says 52.6 is the is the was the high for that year for those years um, for the temperature in summer. So that's one of those things allowed. That's Average one reason why that's that's one of the neat things about tables that allows you to move around like that so that you can actually compare across columns, across rows. If they're marked up correctly, it's easy to tell which column or row you're currently in and what data is 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 there. Show speech. HTML. Okay, what should we do next, uh, Carrie? Let's well, we can get basics. back to yeah, we can get back to the the slides, and then we can uh, ask if there's any questions. I already am seeing a few in the chat and online. So, uh, okay. it, unless anyone in chat wants to ask a Tim if he needs a specific demo, uh, one thing I think would might be interesting for people to understand um, is the differences for you between Jaws and NVDA. Would there be a reason why you would use one over the other? Um, so this is just personal preference and not necessarily reflects reality, but I do find using some of the Office products, Microsoft Office products seem to be a little bit easier with JAWS, but that also may be because JAWS was the first screen reader, Windows screen reader I worked with. And often that's the screen reader you get accustomed to and you get to know the best. And so it may be that NVDA would work just as well in those circumstances, but I just don't have the experience and I feel more comfortable with that way. So, however, honestly, a lot of times I use NVDA uh, rather than JAWS um, in most other cases. And that's largely because it works better uh, on the Windows console and some other environments because I also write code as well um, sometimes just for fun because I really need to get a life, but, uh, the rest of the time, sometimes, you know, because as an accessibility, uh, a specialist, you know, I often will experiment with code to see if a particular suggestion is going to work for somebody. Um, so that's, so those, so that's kind of, I'm kind of split. Most people are probably more purist. Um, they, they may use, they may have more than one screen reader but they rely most heavily on one and the other one's kind of a backup for certain specific circumstances. Um, I also say that I use the iOS devices um, as well and find that just as, just as easy to use. But honestly, I think part of that is because with the iOS devices and touch, touch gestures are a little more simple than you learning the keyboard, uh, keyboard commands. All right, those are some really good, that's a lot of good information. I'm going to go back and take the uh, the share screen. I didn't want to do it without telling you. I'm okay. um, going to go ahead and I'm going to be showing uh, screen 14, which is a screen reader demo. And then that way you know where you are. Uh, yeah. And like I want to want to make sure that we get through the next couple just so we can ask questions. So we just did the demo. We're going to move on to the um, what do you think? What is your suggestion uh, for the practice makes perfect? And do you feel like people are ready to go out and test? So what I would do is, so there's some resources we'll provide you, but there's a lot of stuff on DQ University, uh, great cheat sheets that you can download and print and keep next to your desk to use to remember what the basic things are for setting up a screen or what things you should do, whether that's on Mac or it's on Windows or somewhere else. Uh, the quick keystrokes you should use to be able to do that. But I would actually suggest, this is something that came, was given uh, advice given a long time ago by someone named Bob Regan, uh, who, who often uh, offered wonderful advice. And one of the things he suggested is that 
If you really want to learn how to use a screen reader to be able to do testing and feel effective with it, spend, spend up to, but no more than 30 minutes every day, you know, every work day for a month using that screen reader. Do it like first thing in the morning. Don't, you're not necessarily looking to accomplish major work goals. You may go, you know, for instance, maybe you have a favorite site, like maybe you like to go look at the onion, right? And laugh at the articles, the, the silly articles they have out there. Go, go use your screen reader and spend time there. Or maybe there's something on Amazon you need to purchase, right? Well, turn on the screen reader and go to Amazon and try to purchase that item with the screen reader. You know, find, find tasks, tasks that you've performed before using your eyes without a screen reader and then go in and try to do them with a screen reader. Don't make them necessarily super difficult tasks at first. Make them simple tasks to do. Again, reading articles, whether that's a newspaper or, you know, whatever your favorite website is, often that's a good, good way to start because just reading doesn't require you to know a lot of keystrokes. Um, so, you know, doing things like that and just do that about, you know, again, no more than 30 minutes a day and then do that for about a month. And by the end of the month, you will feel extremely comfortable. You'll feel very comfortable with testing with a screen reader. You'll get to the point where you're comfortable with the, uh, with the, with the keystrokes. You may not, you know, you may still need to have that cheat sheet, but you'll look at that much less. Uh, you may feel even to the point where you're ready to turn up the screen reader speed a little bit but that, that's probably the best way to learn how to test it. The other thing that does for you is you get used to what the expected behavior of a screen reader is. What do you expect it to do? Part of the reason why I have expectations of what my screen reader is gonna do is because I've listened to it for days and days and days. Uh, so I, you reach a point where you're just used to, this is how it should work. Um, so you can kind of gain some of that knowledge as you use it, as well as some of what the challenges are what's good about designs and what's bad about designs. So that's that's definitely one thing you, you definitely want to do. All good advice, that's for sure. Yeah, thanks. Of course, I had to add in a slide <laughs> because uh, I'll quote. So I had I added, for people without disabilities, technology makes things easier. For people with disabilities, technology makes things possible. And this is actually from 1991 in the IBM training manual. What do you think about that, Tim? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's often, uh, technology has been a major influence in my life uh, from a very early age when I had my first program that was a word processor that allowed me to write. And at the time I was always fascinated by writing. So did a lot more writing because of that. But then, you know, because of my vision, my handwriting was terrible. So it provided a way I could turn in papers that were readable, right? As well as the fact that I had trouble reading print on paper, but I could read the, 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 the lighting on the screen. So that meant I was easier for me to do, my, do, do that kind of homework. So for me, technology has always been some, something that basically um, makes things possible that would be otherwise impossible on my own. Um, if you think about one of the things that's cool about current day devices and mobile devices is, so just for instance, it, I at one point purchased a device that would let me read dollar bills. That device was a $300 device. It wasn't particularly portable, <laughs> so I couldn't bring it everywhere with me, right? Now I have a iPhone that I use for, you know, texting and other stuff, but one of the, the features is I can download an app uh, for nothing, actually no cost that will tell me what the bills are that I've been given. So again, that in that's in of course I can take that everywhere I go. I doesn't, it's not a hard thing to lug around. You just put your phone in your pocket and you go and it's there. So, you know, that's one of the neat things about technology is there's a lot of things that at one point would have been impossible for me to do on my own that I can now do on my own. And you know, as, as technology advances, as we get better at making more things accessible, that allows me to do more and more stuff independently without necessarily having to rely on others to accomplish tasks. And that's another key uh, word that we talk about a lot in training is about like um, independence, right? And, and, yeah. and giving people the ability to 
just do normal stuff, right? <laughs> like, yep. It's not even rocket science stuff. Uh, all right, I got one more slide, which is your thank you slide. Go ahead. Yes, and I'm really great. Thanks for everybody. I hope you have uh, questions, more than willing to answer mm -hmm. as many questions as possible. And there I definitely are. want to thank, thank Carrie. Um, I love working with Carrie and I, I, I was, I was <laughs> grateful when she asked me to do this because anytime I can get to work with Carrie is always a good time. And I paid you how much to say that, right? Uh, nothing. <laughs> Just nothing. But we okay. don't have to listen to many of my, my brother's dad jokes. So we're That's free true. of that. That is true. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop share. I just wanted to get a couple minutes at least on there so people can get your email. Uh, otherwise, uh, Tim does not have a current uh, Twitter account, but he does have um, a LinkedIn that we put on uh, the event page as well. So there'll be plenty of ways to get a hold of him and, and you know, even to put, pop it into chat into either, again, either into Twitter, social medias, or into the, the live chat or in the comments section on YouTube. And we'll make sure that Tim gets that uh, that question as well. Yep. All right. So that being said, let me grab the the questions that I'm seeing so far. Give me a second. I'm too many pages open. All right. So we did have a lot of people at the beginning, the top of the hour. They're really excited about this presentation. There's lots of really cool stuff uh, they were looking forward to, and so they were all saying thanks, Tim. Uh, so a lot of positivity here. Uh, the first question I had down here, I'm seeing from let's see, Joanna. She asked about any resources you can recommend as quick reference keystroke commands for different types of screen readers. And yep, Tim, I, just so you know, I did pop our DQ one in. Okay, there, good. So. And that's a, that's actually a really good resource. Um, they they've got if you go into that resource link, they've got a lot of stuff on a bunch of different screen readers. Um, as well as you know how, how you want to set it up, um, what keystrokes you should use to do your testing. Um, so there's some really good resources there, a lot of detail that you can utilize to get things set up and going. Yeah, there's also a reference there for anyone who wants to run NVDA on your Mac. Maybe you have a Mac machine and you want to run a virtual machine and check out some of the key commands that Tim walked through uh, with us today. So definitely take a look at that. Uh, we, if you look at a Mac, if you have your Mac and the keyboard in front of you, uh, you'll notice that you don't have the insert key. Uh, so the trick with Macs, if you're going to do a virtual machine, is either you're going to have to get some hardware to support that, or you can uh, remap your keys like we kind of talked about a little bit earlier. So uh, there are resources there for that as well. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. And we got a question here from Jason uh, Cortez. Let's see. Just lost it. Okay, Tim, uh, do you find yourself viewing the individual page, pages accessibility tree prior to diving into content? Um, you know, that's often a question I get asked about how I go through pages. And to be honest, I think it's probably not different than most people. I don't really go through and scan a whole page before I start using it. Because I've usually come to a website for a specific purpose and so really I'm ready to dive in and figure out, get that thing done and move on to the next stuff. So often, um, instead of going through and reading from all the way to the top, all the way to the bottom, you know, I may start using heading key headings to see what's, what's there on the page or move around by landmarks to see what's out there on the page. If it does it have any landmarks and headings? Okay, it has some stuff. Well, is there anything useful here that gives me an idea? Uh, is it, oh, I think that heading sounds kind of like might be the information I'm looking for on this page. So a lot of times I'm really focused on a, a task of completing a task when I get to a page. Mm -hmm. And so I usually doing the things I don't normally just read through a whole page from top to bottom and then go back and start navigating through it uh, that way. So essentially, if you went to a page for the first time, how would you navigate? What is your technique? And is that different from maybe another person using a screen reader? Um, a lot, it, it could be, because uh, it's just like with, with every other user, there's probably multiple ways to do this stuff. And they pro we probably all, there's probably other people who use their screen reader like I do. And there's a lot of other people who don't necessarily use my this, a screen reader in the same way. So often I, when I get to a page, again, 
usually if I'm at a page, just like anybody else, I'm, I don't just go around and, and bring up pages. Uh, I'm usually at a page because I'm looking to do something. There's a task on my mind. And so often one of the first things I'll do is I'll uh, hit the H key to see if there's headings on the page and start trying to read through the headings to see if, if any of them pertain to the things I'm interested in. If not, maybe, uh, you know, maybe I might start reading through parts of the page, larger parts of the page to see what's there. Although maybe in that case, I might use landmarks to the move to the main section mm -hmm. so I can read that first. Again, it's a lot of it just depends on what task I'm performing. It, really much more task oriented than the whole idea of I'll uh, read the Pell page, figure out what all's there, and then go back and, and start working on my task. It's more like, okay, here's my task. I'm gonna try some keystrokes to see if I can find a fast way to getting where I want. Oh, okay, none of these keys work. Okay, maybe I have to slow down and, and, and read more of the page before I can do anything specific. So pretty much, very much like somebody who is visual, kind of scanning a page and kind of checking out the headlines and then deciding, hey, I want to read that article and then taking the time to kind of get into that. So yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, we have a, a really good question uh, from Sharon and we got a couple plus ones on that. Uh, Tim, I found it very hard to separate the row number from the data and the cells in your table example. What has your learning curve been for interpreting what you hear from a screen reader? Um, that can take a while. So like you said, the, the, that table information can be a lot harder, especially if it's telling you row number and the data after that it's a number. Uh, it can take a while to get used to. I remember when I first learned how to use a screen reader, the estimate was on average, somebody who was new to a screen reader would take about three months to adjust fully to using a screen reader because it is, it's different. You have to listen to things in a different way than when you would actually visually read them. So some of those things can be harder, but then also the other thing is sometimes, uh, like for instance, we talked about the speech speech rate. I don't always mm -hmm. keep it at the same speech rate. Sometimes I'll change things like punctuation and speech rate uh, depending on what I'm reading. I can read, you know, if, if I'm reading a paragraph of text um, they say we were exchanging, uh, we were talking about some, you know, let's say for instance, Harry and I were planning a presentation and we were having a conversation about the type of stuff we're going to cut through email, right? I, I might turn that speed up uh, because, you know, I'll be able to understand it. I'll be able to understand mm -hmm. it without necessarily slowing it down. But if I'm working on code, um, I'll turn the punctuation way up and I might m have the speed of the synthesizer much slower because there's all these little details that really make a big, huge difference in understanding what's going on in a, in a piece of code. So, so the, there's things like that I'll do, or maybe mm -hmm. I might stop and reread that thing and say, it said, okay, it said row six, 27.4. Okay, what is, let me read that. Okay, row six refers to the row I was in. Okay, I got a better idea of how that works. So it can it can take some time to get used mm -hmm. to that, that some of that stuff. And some of that for you probably was practice too, right? It's not yeah. like it just happened overnight. It's, it's getting used to it, right? It's again, there's no there's no superpowers involved. Unfortunately, I did not get any daredevil superpowers. <laughs> Uh, You're not which Iron I, Man. <laughs> well, let's just put it this way: I remind my brother's children of that when they leave a cup of water on my table at my house. I say, "By the way, I'm not Daredevil. I can't tell where those cups are except for by knocking them over later when you're gone." So, so it's you know it's one of those type of things. There's no supervisors. It's just learning how to use it, and you start off slow and with small amounts, and then you get you more and more. And it takes time to get used to it. And, and of course, anytime you run into something new that you haven't run into again, you have to slow down a bit again and get used to that until it becomes familiar. All right. I know you like to talk, Tim. So I'm going to try to get through some of these sure. questions. If we don't, uh, if we run out of time, then we'll make sure to have Tim answer that in the comment section. Or we can even just have you back. We can do a reoccurring uh, sure. screen reader uh, series because I feel like the uh, it's really difficult for a lot of people and uh, a lot of questions that come out. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to see if I can get through a couple more. So we have Carolina was asking, Tim, essentially, what is the usefulness of the NVDA speech reader window? So really the value of that is for people who have sight who are doing testing. 
Uh, it's no value to me to have it up there, but if you're not used to using a screen reader, reading that, reading that information might be easier to do. I suppose mm -hmm. for some people who might have, who might, well, I suspect if you're deaf and also have visual impairments, you're more likely to use a braille display, but really it's one of those things that's more, I think has a more value for, for sighted people who are doing testing with a, with a screen reader to be able to see, see what the text is saying so that you can do things like say, oh, what was that? Did it say it was a link? Oh yeah, it did say it was a link. Uh, what was the name? Okay, that name of that link makes no, absolutely no sense. You know, so, so it gives you a way to verify what you heard and so you can see it. And, you know, again, for somebody who's sighted, listening to screen reader may be more challenging, but being able to see what was said uh, makes that makes that less challenging. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we have a few questions uh, that kind of wrap around the same kind of concept of what are you are the most essential HTML elements for understanding a web page uh, for you specifically? And they gave the example of things like headings or alt text, uh, link descriptions, uh, landmarks, that sort of thing. Um. I suspect that the ones I rely on most are headings and landmarks as the quickest way to get around a page. Maybe after that, I tend to use the navigation for forms controls, to find forms controls. Mm -hmm. So those are probably the big three. I mean, I do use some of the other keystrokes, but something tells me um, just based on what I can recall from past experience, I probably use those the most. Uh, overwhelmingly the most for, for getting around and looking at a page quickly. Um, and I don't necessarily, again, it's not that I don't use the others. And then for instance, the table keystrokes are really important if there's a, if there's a table on the page, but I probably use those less either because those elements don't tend to be the ones I'm trying to search for as often or, mm -hmm. you know, just again, but like you said, that's, that's for me, um, that might be similar to other people's experience who are blind, but really, you know, my feeling is always, I, I would love to do usability tests for everything uh, yes. to get more data on stuff like this. So really all I have is my opinion and I'm, I'm trying to make a, come up with an informed opinion, but I don't have enough data to say, that's how I do it. I think that may be similar for other people, but I would not bet large amounts of money on my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> And that really ties well into the last question that we had. Um, how effective really is having non-native users do that kind of screen reader kinds of research? Like if I was going to have a QA team or I'm about to go live with a, a new feature, what is the best practice? Like if I could, if I had all the money and all the time in the world, what, what would I do versus the things that I have to do. I think really what you're trying to do with the screen reader and testing in QA is just make sure, you know, hopefully if you've got your, you know, hopefully your team is in a position where they know what they need to do to make things accessible. You know, they got that knowledge, the training to do that. They've got the tools to be able to make things accessible. And really what QA is, is making sure that the stuff, the right stuff got done. So for instance, if somebody, you know, oh, we're going to add this, we're going to add this image here to this design. Well, okay, what, what we should need, but meaningful alt text. Okay, well, you know, we're the designers. We know why it's here, so we can come up with a meaningful alt text. Okay, we passed it off to the developer. The developer then codes that, right? And then the QA just makes sure, you know what, that meaningful alt text, did it get, did that image get that label correctly? Yeah, that's, that's what passes. Nope, it didn't pass, you know, those type of things. So it's really about checking to make sure the techniques and the uh, decisions that you made, your team made about the impact accessibility, that basically on, on that end of the project, when you're getting ready to implement, they've all been executed correctly. It may also allow you to catch some things that maybe the team didn't notice. But, you know, ultimately the goal is to try to limit those things to only you know, where the only things you kind of miss are the stuff that's minor and you don't miss anything major through that testing. All right, Tim, that uh, brings us to the hour. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Our time just speeds by. Um, I appreciate your time. 
I, we didn't have time for a dad joke or two, so you'll have to have come back and uh, give us a little bit more uh, knowledge. Maybe we could do a screen reader intermediate session where sure. you can talk about um, like the elements list or some of the higher navigation uh, questions that people have been having as well. So yep, uh, a reminder. Help out too. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Uh, just a reminder, everyone, the links uh, will be available later in the YouTube video when it's posted. Um, make sure that you join us next month. And actually, it's going to be only about three weeks. So we're going to get back to it pretty quickly. Um, as a reminder, we're always looking and recruiting for new speakers. So we make a conscious effort to include marginalized groups in our speaker lineup. So let us know. Again, DM us or pop it into the chat and let us know how to make accessibility talks even more friendly. Um, of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel or to our new calendar system and that way you'll never miss a talk. Again, Tim, thank you so much for being here. I uh, appreciate it so much. And it was a really awesome talk. So thank you so much for your time. Sure, you're welcome. Thanks, Carrie. <laughs>